theorem for line integrals. So, Oh, we're going to try to build theorem of calculus of integral calculus uh, to some additional concepts. In this case, the first one we're going to be looking at is the line integral. So recall that the integral from a to b of f prime is just f evaluated at a and b. So it's f of b minus f of a. Theorem. <clears throat> Let c be a piecewise smooth curve given by the vector function r for t between a and b. Let f be a differentiable function whose gradient vector nabla f is continuous on c then the integral over C of the gradient of F dot dr is just equal to F of r at t evaluated on the interval a to b. It's just F r of b minus F r of a. So notice that this is near, this is the exact same statement that we had from the fundamental theorem of calculus. So <clears throat> again, let's recall from a minute ago, a K form omega is said to be exact if there is a K minus one form phi such that omega equals d phi. So the independence of paths for exact forms. If omega is exact and C1 and C2 are two parameterized curves with the same starting point and with the same ending point, then the integral of omega over the curve C1 is the same as the integral of omega over the curve C2. So if you're integrating exact forms, then it doesn't matter uh, what the curve looks like. It really only uh, makes a difference uh, what happens at the endpoints. And, and that's, we're just looking at the endpoints. a closed curve. If C is a parameterized curve whose starting point is the same as its ending point, then C is said to be closed. Integration of exact forms over a closed curve. <clears throat> if omega is exact and if C is closed, then the integral of omega over C, sometimes we put a little, well, a little circle here to indicate that, um, that, that, that is a closed curve you're gonna integrate over. Independence of paths. F, a continuous vector field with domain D, then, the integral of f dot dr over c is said to be independent of the path if the integral of f dot dr of c1 is equal to the integral f dot dr of c2 for all paths c1 and c2 in d. if uh, such that r at a uh, over the um, curve c1 is the same at r of a over the curve c2 and 
R, well, the endpoint B for C1, the same as the endpoint B for C2. I'll just say that, it'll be easier. Uh, the integral, F dot DR over C is independent path, if and only if. The integral of F dot DR of C is equal to zero for every closed path C in the domain D. And as I said before, if you have a closed path, sometimes this is denoted by this little, this L with this little circle in the middle. And so this little circle in the middle, middle says that you're integrating over a closed path. A connected region. D is connected if any two points can be joined by a path in D. So if we have some region D here, it is said to be connected if you take any point, in another point in D, and somehow you can connect them using some path. Theorem. Suppose F is a vector field that is continuous on an open connected region D, then the integral of F dr over C is independent of path in D implies that F is cons a conservative vector field on D, which if you um, recall, means that there exists some function f such that the vector field f is equal to gradient of f. It's a gradient vector field. It's exact. And so uh, in the terminology of differential forms, we called it an exact form. In the terminal vector fields, we call it a conservative vector field. Uh, it's really the same thing. It's just different terminology in analogous uh, situations. So there's this more or less course, and I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more, between these vector fields and these differential forms. Theorem. If F is equal to P times the vector I, so this is the so P plus Q J is a conservative vector field. So these are the components of your vector field. Well, P and Q have first order partial derivatives in the domain D. Then throughout D, the partial of P with respect to Y is the same as the partial of <coughs> Q with respect to X. A simple curve. <coughs> C is a simple curve if it does not intersect except possibly at the endpoints. Um, in other words, that uh, R at T1 is not equal to R T2 for all A, uh, all T1, T2 between A and B. And so, hmm. So either, so you start somewhere in somewhere or you start in the same place. Uh, the following is not a simple curve. If you start, but then you cross over. And so this sort of uh, intersecting itself, 
uh, means that you're not a uh, simple curve here. Simply connected region. D is a simply connected region if uh, between every two points in D, there exists a path connecting them and every loop in D can be contracted to a point. So suppose I, I have this region here. This region here is not uh, simply connected. Well, uh, you can take any point in here and connect it with a path, with, with a, a path. So it is path connected. But if you take this point here and uh, take a loop, and let's take this, well, actually, let's do this in red. So suppose you have some point here and, you know, you could contract, if you took this loop, you could contract it. But if you take this loop, once you've taken this loop, if you keep shrinking the loop to make it smaller and smaller, all of a sudden it'll get hooked with this hole in the middle and you won't be able to contract it anymore. And so there's no way to contract this loop to a point because there's a hole here that, that you're, you're, you're sort of, uh, the loops grab a hold of holes. So it, you can't have holes in simply connect theorem. Let F equal P, have components P and Q. <clears throat> Let this be a vector field on an open simply connected region D. Suppose that P and Q have continuous first order partial derivatives and the partial of P with respect to Y is the same as the partial of Q with respect to X throughout D. Then F is continuous, it's conservative. The Hodge star operator. Uh, Hodge is the person's name, so it's always capitalized. So the Hodge star operator is a linear operator on the exterior algebra of D, uh, mapping uh, k vectors to n minus k vectors. Let alpha and beta be these uh, be k forms. Then alpha wedge the Hodge star of beta is the same as the, this is a symmetric bilinear form. So <clears throat> rather than use the definition here, let me give you some particulars to show you how it works. So basically uh, this hot star operator, you go from K forms to n minus k forms uh, and back and forth. So it takes, it's sort of this uh, correspondence. Well, it takes one, you know, k form to n minus k form and the n minus k form to a k form. So it, it, it sort of goes back and forth between these forms. So let's look at some particular examples of what it does. So in R3, R3, particular ordering. So our ordering will be, well, you've seen this before, uh, this notation. So I'll put in dx, dy, dz. So the star of dx x is going to be wedge dz. The star of dy is, well, dy wedge dx. 
a DZ. I said it, <laughs> I said it wrong. <laughs> I pointed, but I said wrong. The star, the hard star of DY is DZ wedge DX. The hard star of DZ is DX wedge DY. So, if I take the star operator of the following one form in R3, F dx plus G dy plus H dz, then this, you'll just get F, well, dx goes to dy wedge dz plus G dy goes to dz cross uh, wedge dx plus h dx wedge dy. Oh, let's go back up here to show you this. dy, so the star dy dz is dx. So star dy ID wedge dz is dx. Okay. Uh, the star of dx dy is dz. Oh, there it is. <laughs> I did in a different order. The star of dx wedge dy is dz. And the star of dz dx is dy. So the star of D, uh, dz wedge dx is dy. So the star operator of f dy wedge plus g dz wedge dx plus h dx wedge dy is f dy wedge dz is dx plus g, the star of dz wedge dx is dy plus h, the star of dx wedge dy is dz. So let me give you, and this is going to be some the magic of uh, this exterior calculus and this somehow will make all these formulas that we'll be giving you in this chapter really, even though they look like I'm giving you 100 formulas, they're all will be under one or two um, really formulas that I give you uh, along with all those properties that I gave you for how to work with this ex exterior algebra. Okay, so <clears throat> correspondence between exterior derivative and these vector operations. So, so if I have a zero form and I take the exterior derivative of a zero form, I get a one form. Corresponding to that is if I take a function and then apply nabla to it, the del operator to it, I get another vector field and this is just my gradient. If I apply the exterior derivative to a one form, I get a two form. The two form that I get is, well, well corresponds to the following. If I uh, take a vector field and I take the curl uh, and it's sort of denoted by the nabla cross whatever, your vector field. This is the, the uh, del operator cross 
your vector field, you get another vector field. And so this is the curl of your vector field. If you take, and, and I'm only doing this in R3. Uh oh, I should. St I was doing, I uh, for this whole last few things that I've been doing have all been R three, but I better specify it again. So, <clears throat> if I take a two form, apply the exterior derivative to it, I'll get a three form. There's nothing past this for R three, so. everything else is going to be zeros. To the same as taking a vector field, apply a divergence operator to it and getting a function. This uh, divergence operator is sometimes denoted by uh, del dot or by div. Uh, the curl is sometimes denoted by, well, just curl. Notice that I have the again and the following correspondence um, from yesterday. I said that uh, d squared is equal to zero. So for any uh, differential form, I have that uh, if you take uh, the differential form, the exterior derivative of the exterior derivative of a differential form, you get zero. And we, uh, we, we uh, wrote this in shorthand notation as d squared equals zero. Well, suppose I start with a one form, take the, uh, well, let, let's, let's, let's do this. Start with the zero form, take the exterior derivative of that to get a one form, take the exterior derivative of that to get the Two form, which is actually zero. What does that correspond to in vector calculus? Well, you take a function to get some vector field, take the curl of that to get another vector field, which turns out to be zero. So d squared equaling zero. zero corresponds to the fat, the curl of a gradient is zero. Let's start with a one form, take the exterior derivative to get a two form, take the exterior derivative of that to get the three form, which I know is zero. That corresponds to taking a vector field, taking this gradient to get another vector field, and then taking the divergence of that to get zero. So, for any vector field V, we will, in the future, notice that the divergence of the curl of any vector field is zero. And so in the near future, well, actually it's the rest of this chapter. This is basically this gives us almost all the stuff that we're gonna be doing throughout this chapter. There's, a, there's other things we need, but uh, this is a good majority of it. So uh, even though it looks like we're doing a whole bunch of weird different things when we talk about vector fields, um, if I talk about different forms, uh, it, it's, it, it all looks the same. So we're not doing anything fancy. A pullback. So we'll be needing the concept of pullback. Um, actually, I've given you throughout this course, uh, different situations where we use pullbacks. And uh, I use that terminology because, well, um, when we come up to it, which is just about now, you've sort of seen it, how it was used in calculus one and I gave gave you that new terminology. So now, let G map X to Y, and let this be a smooth mapping, where X is an open subset of R n, 
and Y is an open subset of RM. Then the pullback is the unique linear map, G star. Now this is an unfortunate notational problem. And so please notice a pullback has a star, but it says a superscript. And I know now, the head, the Hodge operator is a star also, but it's a star at the same level as your four script. And so as a superscript, those are pullbacks. On the same level, uh, those are going to be the Hodge operator, the Hodge star operator. OK, so. <clears throat> That was just a little notational thing, just so that you notice. So <clears throat> the pullback is the unique linear map G star, so that's a pullback of G, taking forms on Y to forms on X, such that the following holds. If F is a zero uh, form, of f uh, maps y to r is a function on y, then the pullback of g at x is just composition. It's just f composed g. So the last part of our, our quote unquote formula after things have been manipulated comes out to be that it's a, uh, a notation involving composition. Next, if alpha and beta are differential forms on y. Oh, by the way, uh, you do notice that, and I, just to remind you, hopefully I said it, uh, that when I say a form, a differential form. Uh, so when I say a k form, I mean a differential k form. Uh, it's just that usually we uh, don't say the term differential uh, if you, if it's understood that we're talking about differential forms. So <clears throat> let alpha and beta be uh, forms on y, then the pullback of g, alpha wedge beta, is the pullback g of alpha of g beta. Next. So as you keep doing this, that, that means you can keep pulling, you know, so you went from having a wedge of two uh, forms to just having the wedge of these two pullbacks. And so eventually you'll come out to where it's just, uh, you're just doing the pullback of a zero form and then you use this identity. If, and then, well, also you should use this guy. If alpha is a form on Y, then the pullback of G, D alpha of the exterior derivative of the form alpha is equal to the exterior derivative of the pullback G alpha. Change of variables. Let G be an orientation uh, from an open set U to an open subset V of Rn. Orientation preserving uh, means that in the, well, we'll be talking about that more later, I guess. Uh, it's going in the uh, same orientation. And so it doesn't reverse the orientation. And let alpha be a compact on V. Um, actually, 
Eventually, you'll be able to get rid of this compactly supported. Uh, what compactly supported means is that uh, outside of a closed set, uh, if we're doing RN, then outside of a a closed and bounded set, then the integral over U of the pullback g of alpha is equal to the integral over v of the form alpha. Okay, so in this notation, a lot of the formulas look a lot simpler. Let's do on page 1000 134. In problems 3 through 10, determine whether or not the uh, vector field F is a conservative vector field. If it is, find the function F such that F, the vector field F, is equal to the gradient of F. So we just want to show that this uh, that the corresponding, if I looked at the corresponding differential form, that's the exact differential form. Now, so, oh, I should have said that also, that uh, conservative is the same as exact. So uh, I, I should have, here, wait, let me actually fill that in a little bit more. So, so this says that if you have a, uh, an exact form, that's the same as a conservative vector field. Okay, so. Let's finish this. Actually, since I'm here, let's add another page. Okay, problem number six. F is equal, the vector field F has components uh, y e to the x and component e to the x plus e to the y. Okay, so I want to determine if this is conservative. And so if you recall, if f, so conservative vector field, We actually had a condition in order for, if a condition held, we had a theorem that if a condition held, uh, that then this vector field would be conservative. So suppose F is equal to PQ, uh, let's just write it as PQ. Then uh, this vector field would be conservative if we can show that the partial of P with respect to Y is equal to partial of Q with respect to X. So let's show that. So let's determine the derivatives. Mm, well, the partials. These particular partials 
for this vector field. So let's figure out the partial of P with respect to Y. And so if I take the partial of this with respect to Y, well, the partial of Y e to the X with respect to Y is just, um, is just e to the x. The partial <laughs> of q with respect to x. Well, let's take the partial of q with respect to x. Uh, the partial of this respect to x is, well, e to the x plus, well, the partial of this constant is just going to be zero. And so this is equal to e to the x. Since these are equal, then we have that this vector field is conservative. I guess I need another. So uh, it says that, well, uh, the corresponding differential form is exact. Okay, so let's try to see what that means. So that means that there exists some function f such that, uh, the exterior derivative of a form, or in this case, the grade of F, that F, well, actually, let's write it this way, that F is equal to the gradient of, that the differential form is equal to the exterior derivative of a, uh, different form of uh, degree one less. So uh, I have that the gradient of F therefore is equal to, um, well, let's see, F was Y e to the X e to the X plus e to the y. Okay, so this says that the partial so I can either try to uh, set the partial of f, f respect to x equal to this or the partial of f respect to y equal to this. In this case, it really doesn't matter, but this looks easier. So let's take the partial of f respect to x equal to y e to the x. And so let's try to solve for f. Well, I can integrate both sides of my equation. So I get that f. So I'm treating y here as a constant. The integral of e to the x is just e to the x. Plus some arbitrary constant and the constant is constant with respect to y. So now I also have that the partial of f respect to y is equal to the second component. e to the x plus e to the y. So I have that e to the x plus e to the y is equal to, well, let's take the partial of this respect to y. So this is going to be uh, the derivative of y times the constant e to the x is just e to the x 
plus a derivative of the function c is just c prime. And so, let's put another page here. And so uh, the e of the x is cancel. So I have that c prime is equal to e to the y. So therefore, c is this just equal to e to the y plus a constant. I'm going to just use the name c also for the constant. So therefore, I have that f has the following form. It's just equal to y e to the x plus my constant e to the y plus c, where c really is a constant. And that is my potential function. Okay, so in exercises 12 through 13, A, find a function f such that, oh, and I guess I should make a comment before I do this, I'm sorry. Uh, what you do notice is that if you have taken, oh, I guess people haven't taken, when you take dif uh, differential equations, what you'll notice is, is that similar, that's really exact, uh, to solving exact differential equations. So the idea that we're doing here is the same thing that you did with exact differential equations. Uh, again, the this is because it all has to do with exact. Okay, so in exercises 12 through 18, find a function f such that the vector field f is the gradient of f, and b, use part a to evaluate the integral of f dot dr over c along the given curve c. Okay, so let's do that. So the vector function is just equal to, um, well, the first component, one plus xy quantity e to the xy. The second component, x squared e to the xy, where the curve r has the following components. Cosine of t is the first component. The second component is two sine t for t between zero and pi over two. So <clears throat> let's do part A. I want to find uh, the potential function, okay? So, um, first I'm going to set the gradient of f equal to the vector field f. And so I have that the gradient of f is therefore going to equal one plus xy e to the xy x squared e to the xy. Okay, so this says that the partial of f respect to x is this first one, partial of f respect to y is the second one. Well, the partial of F, the second part, the second component here, 
looks much easier to integrate. Uh, so integrating this respect to X is not so easy. Integrating this respect to Y seems much easier. So let's just look at this part. So this is X squared E to the X, Y. Okay, so <clears throat> let's try to integrate this respect to Y. And so I have that F is equal to, well, <clears throat> the integral of a constant is just that constant x squared. Integral of e to a constant times y is e to that constant y divided by the constant. So x squared divided by x is just going to equal x plus a constant and I'm integrating respect to y. So x's are treated as constants. So plus some function c of x. Well, I also have that the gradient, so the partial of f with respect to x was equal to the first component of that vector field. And so the first component of the vector field was one plus x, y, e to the xy. So I have that, and let's multiply this out. I have that e to the xy plus xy e to the xy should equal. So now let's take the partial of this with respect to x. And so the partial respect to x, I'm going to use the product rule, drew the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. So the derivative of e to any exponent is e to the exponent times the derivative of the exponent. Well, the derivative of x times the constant plus the derivative of a c is just c prime. So I guess the e to the x, y, and the x, y, e to the x, y cancel. So I have that c prime is zero. And so, <laughs> okay, mm, sorry about that. So the constant, f of x, y is just equal to x e to the x, y plus c. And that is your answer. Let me do part b. Okay, so that was part A. So part B says to use this. Okay, so, so now let's integrate. So part B, hopefully I said part A up here. Yeah, good, I said part A. So now let's do part B. So the integral of f dot dr, that was a notation they were using, or c, this is equal to the integral of the gradient of f dot dr. Okay. So, <clears throat> well, I know that by the fundamental theorem of line integrals that the, that the integral 
of a gradient uh, dot dr that this is just going to be f of r, uh, let's say a t, where t is evaluated from uh, beginning, um, well, let's see, from a to b. And so in this case, the function f is going to be evaluated at r and r has components cosine t uh, sine t and this will be evaluated uh, between zero for t uh, equaling zero to t equaling pi over two and so let's plug in so f what was it, X? <laughs> I just forgot, I just did it. Oh, by the way, since I am integrating, I can take any antiderivative that I want. And so uh, the fact that we have a constant here doesn't make any difference. So let's just take this as our function. So X, E to the X, Y, so X, e to the x, y. And let's integrate that between zero and pi over two. Okay. Note that, and maybe I'll just pull it down one since I don't have any room anyway. Notice that two cosine t sine t again is uh, sine of two t is two sine t cosine t. Uh, this again is one of these uh, double angle formulas uh, for trigonometry. So this is the same as cosine t e to the sine 2t, evaluated from zero to pi over two. Okay, so let's plug in pi over two. So cosine pi over two is zero. Wait, cosine? No, 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 cosine yeah, cosine pi over two, that's zero. So cosine pi over two, I get zero. Sine of pi is zero. Plug in and cosine of zero is one. Sine of zero is zero. That's e to the zero. And so I get that this is equal to negative one. Okay. In exercises 19 through 20, show that the line integral is independent of path and evaluate its integral. So, <clears throat> Problem number 20. Integral sine y dx plus x cosine y minus sine y dy. I'm integrating this over c, where c is any path from 2, 0 to 1 pi. Uh, so you notice that here uh, in the book, they're actually using this differential form notation. So this is just a one form. So we're integrating a one form over a path 
Oh, by the way, I forgot. Let's see if I can. Oh, here, wait one second. Can I move this? Is there any way to grab? Oh, I can. Okay, there. Aha. So that was any part of it. Okay, so what is the line integral? Okay, so now I forgot about this. It's a nice, this is a great animation. And so this is actually from Wikipedia. So suppose you have a vector, a scalar field. And suppose you have a function over a scalar field and that this is some curve on a scalar field. So it's like temperature. So you have some hot spots. So notice this curve actually goes up and down. And so what is the line integral doing over a scalar field? Let's move it, let's stretch it out. So we're really looking at this signed integral here of this curve. So let me play it once more take about one minute. So here you have the scalar field. So this is some scalar field. And here is some curve over the scalar field defined by F. And so here's this nice scalar field. The, the, this is what the curve looks like over this scalar field. And so now to find the line integral, it's really this signed area of this curve over that scalar field. Okay, good. Let me get back. So that, that gives you a nice visualization of what we're talking about. So good, I actually for the last, I was supposed to show you that, that last time I forgot, and I almost forgot to show it to you this time, but that's a good visualization. Uh, showing you what uh, we're doing. Okay, so back to what we're doing here. Uh, so <clears throat> let me look at the partial of P with respect to Y. So I want to, maybe I'll, I'll say that first. Well, the first thing I want to do is I want to show I want to show that this is a conservative vector field. So to do that, I will show that the partial of P with respect to Y is the same as a partial of Q with respect to X. So that's what I'm doing. So the partial of P with respect to Y, uh, the partial, so the partial derivative of sine of Y is cosine Y. Oops, let me insert another page. Uh, I wanna find the partial of Q with respect to Y, with respect to X, sorry. Okay, so let's look at X cosine Y minus sine Y. Well, Y here is treated as a constant with respect to um, X is just going to be, uh, well, the partial of X times the constant Y, uh, constant cosine Y minus the, cons the derivative of the constant sine Y. The derivative of a constant is zero, so I don't have to worry about that. So the derivative of a constant times X is just the constant, cosine Y. And so these partials are equal equal since these partials are equal then I have that uh, F uh, sine Y 
uh, x cosine y minus sine y, that this is a conservative vector field. Okay, so that implies that uh, there exists an F uh, such that the gradient of F is equal to the vector field F. Uh, maybe I'll write it the other way that the vector field F is a gradient vector field. Okay, so the partial, let's see, the partial of F with respect to X is sine of Y. It's constant, therefore F is just equal to x times the constant plus another constant, uh, c, the function uh, c of y. Well, we have that. The partial of f with respect to y is equal to the second component. Uh, and the second component was X cosine Y minus sine Y. So I have that X cosine Y minus sine Y is equal to, let's take the partial of this respect to y. And so this is going to be, well, a uh, derivative of a constant times sine of y is that constant times derivative of sine of y, which is cosine y, plus the derivative of c, which is just c prime. So this is just C prime Y. Well, the X cosine Y is cancel. So you have that C prime is just minus sine Y. C is just cosine of Y plus a constant. And so we get that F is equal to x sine y plus cosine y plus c. Oh, wait, 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 wait. So that's what F is, okay? Uh, we wanna show that it's independent, okay? So, so we already did that. So now that we have this, okay, good. <clears throat> Next, I should have said that, <clears throat> the gradient of F, that this is continuous everywhere. And so since it's continuous everywhere, then it will be path independent.
And so, we can now evaluate this. So the integral uh, over C of the differential form sine y dx plus x cosine y minus sine y dy. So the integral of this uh, differential form, since it's exact, is equal to the integral over C of the gradient of F dot dr, which is equal to F evaluated at R for T between A and B And so, this is equal to f of x, y. And we start out at 2, 0. And we end up at, at. So in our problem, We started at two zero and we ended at, at one pi. And I can take for F, uh, I don't really need this, it, just with all integrations, uh, you can take any of the uh, forms of this antiderivative. So I don't really need uh, plus C. So I'll just do this is equal to x y x sine y plus cosine y, and you're evaluating this from two zero to one pi. Okay, so let's plug in everything. So. For x plug in one, hmm. for x plug in one, uh, sine of pi is zero plus uh, plug in uh, one for x and pi for y. So sine, cosine of pi is negative one and subtract, plug in two for x and zero for y, two for x and zero for y. And so I get a negative of one minus one, and that's your answer. Oops, I just noticed I am like five minutes over. Okay, so that's it for today. And we'll finish off, there's just like one. Oh, there's only, let, actually, let me just do the last, last problem, because that only take 30. So let's finish that off, and I'll finish off section 60.3. In problems 31 through 34, determine whether or not the given set is A, open, B, connected, C, simply connected. So A, is this open? So uh, problem number 34, the set of all x, y, so that x, y is not equal to 2, 3. So basically it's a, uh, it's the all of our two except for one point, except for the point 2, 3. So certainly it is an open set if you take any point in the plane uh, that's not uh, any point in the set at 
than, than every open set uh, that's completely contained in the uh, set. So yes, it's certainly open. B, is it connected? Well, if you take any point, let's take, actually, let's go with a red. If you take some point and another point, you can certainly connect it with the path. And so certainly it's connected. So it's open, it's connected. C, is it simply connected? Well, if you take some point here and you take a loop, there's, you can't contract it because eventually you're gonna get caught around this point two three. And so no, this is not simply connected. And so not simply connected. And so 